So, some stuff has gone down here in New York, as the city has been rightfully forced to confront its own systemic racism after the brutal murder of George Floyd by Minnesota police. I may not know what it's like to be black in the United States, but I do know a little bit about New York history, and it's a little more checkered than most people realize. So I'm going to give you a little virtual tour, whatever that means. Oh man, I need to get outside and make money again. And I'm going to show you how racism has shaped even New York City, a place famous for its diversity, its openness, and its M&M store. And every American city has a similar, if not darker, past. Now keep in mind, I do this tour for middle schoolers, so if your inclination is to lash out or attack me personally, you are less mature than a 13-year-old. So let's start at the beginning. This is the Middle Passage Memorial. It is an art piece by Lorenzo Pace and it is meant to mimic the art of the Bambara people, an important West African ethnicity. It evokes a ship as a reminder of the Middle Passage, which is the leg of the triangular trade that brought slaves from Africa over to the New World. This is Wall Street, and it is named that because it was the location of a wall that was built there in 1653 to protect the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam. Ah, that fact is totes presh, as the kids say. You know what fact is not totes presh? It was built by slaves. The British took over New Amsterdam in 1664 and renamed it New York, and the situation for slaves became even worse than under the Dutch. At one point, the only other city in the colonies with a higher proportion of slaves was Charleston. Yeah, that Charleston. In 1711, here at Wall Street and Water Street, the first slave market in New York was opened, and it was the second biggest anywhere at the time. It was built so there could be a constant buying and selling, and no slave would get too comfortable in one place for too long. African people were unloaded from boats at Pier 17 and taken straight to the market. Pier 17 is today's South Street Seaport, a collection of restaurants and shops with no reference to any tragedy, unless you count Sarah Jessica Parker's overpriced shoe store. By 1741, the city's population had swelled to almost 10,000 people, and almost 2,000 of those people were slaves. One in five households had at least one slave, and they accounted for one-third of the workforce. White people were nervous about the amount of slaves in New York City, so they were very oppressed. In fact, they couldn't congregate in groups bigger than three. That's what happens when you oppress people. You fear them, and then you police them harder under the guise of security. Sound familiar? So in 1741, when 10 fires sprouted up around the city, 200 slaves were rounded up, and 80 confessed under duress. 13 were burned at the stake, 17 were hanged, and 70 were sent to the Caribbean. And I'm not talking about Margaritaville, because slavery in the Caribbean was pretty much a death sentence. This is France's Tavern at the corner of Pearl and Broad Street. It first opened in 1762 and served many roles in New York during the American Revolution. During the war, the population of slaves in the city ballooned because the British had captured New York and had promised blacks freedom in return for fighting on their side. And why shouldn't they? They were brought here by force and they were treated as property. Here's a fact. Two of George Washington's own slaves escaped to New York to fight with the British. That's something you won't find on a Snapple cap. When the British lost the conflict, they negotiated the freedom of about 3,000 slaves at France's Tavern and eventually evacuated a lot of those slaves to Nova Scotia. It was so bad for black people in the United States that they fled New York for Nova Scotia. So the U.S. gained its independence. You know who didn't? Slaves. The Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution, which purported that all men are created equal, were both written by slave owners and excluded black people. And women, but that's a whole different video. The foundation of American independence and democracy was built on hypocrisy and racism. Well, maybe Americans would treat slaves a little better than the British, since they thought they were oppressed under the British. Ah, uh, no. This is the National Burial Ground Monument on Duane Street in Lower Manhattan. In 1991, construction began on 290 Broadway, and when they were excavating, they found a six-acre burial ground containing around 15,000 intact skeletal remains. What they had found was a slave burial ground. Slaves back then were buried outside of the city limits because no one wanted to be around them, and as the city expanded, they built right over it and forgot about it. Slavery wasn't abolished in New York until 1827, which is pretty late for a northern state. But even though they were free, they were still considered the lowest of the low, 
and many of them were forced to live in the worst parts of the city, including the Five Points, which is today's Chinatown. It was a heavily Irish neighborhood that was immortalized in the movie Gangs of New York. A movie that, like slavery in New York, went on way too long. And while the Irish were persecuted, they could still access jobs that black people could not. Even though slavery was abolished in New York in 1827, the city was still the dominant port for trafficking in slaves and was torn on the issue of slavery when the Civil War began in 1861 between the North and the South. In fact, the deadliest riots in the history of the United States happened in July 1863 in response to the draft instituted by President Lincoln. Fueled by their resentment towards blacks, an angry white mob, mostly Irish, killed around 100 people, mostly black, and burned down over 100 buildings, including the Colored Orphans Asylum. What the fu- Now this is an important fact. When slavery ended in the United States in 1863, the system of oppression did not. It was merely transformed. First came federally supervised reconstruction in the southern states, which made some progress. But when the military stopped intervening on behalf of the newly free in 1877, southern state governments slowly started what they called redemption. Pretty cute. Enacting Jim Crow laws and brutality to keep blacks persecuted in the late 1800s and early 1900s. This terror eventually sent many black families out of the South and into the North during what is called the Great Migration. Black people were fugitives in the country that they built by force. So this is Harlem, a neighborhood that by the late 1800s had become increasingly black because overdevelopment and vacancies had pushed a lot of the landlords to open up to black families. Families. Because it was the destination for many on the Great Migration, the 1920s saw a period known as the Harlem Renaissance, when its art and culture thrived, creating talents like Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston. Well, the Great Depression hit the country in the 1930s and everybody in New York suffered, especially black people. They were treated differently even in the government programs that were meant to help the country bounce back. This is the Harlem River Houses and it was built as public housing by the federal government in 1936. It was exclusively for black people. <sighs> that segregation in New York City. Also, as part of federal housing loan guarantees to help stimulate the economy with mortgages and home ownership, the government introduced redlining, which could have its own video. This really happened. Basically, this insidious process classified neighborhoods based on desirability for purposes of guiding banks in giving out loans that the government would guarantee. And one of the principal deal breakers for a loan was how many blacks a neighborhood had. That basically meant that banks wouldn't give loans for businesses or homes in black neighborhoods or to black people. And it meant that the new suburbs for America's burgeoning middle class literally and many times explicitly did not allow blacks. Not only did this dictate the racial makeup and resource allocation of neighborhoods for decades to come, but it severely hindered black people's ability to accrue wealth for generations. The FHA put an official end to redlining in 1968, but it was rarely enforced and banks and loan companies continued to use the same or similar maps as before. Today, neighborhoods like Bushwick, Crown Heights, and Bed-Stuy that were redlined are being gentrified because the property value has been so low, developers see more potential for profit. That too could be its own video. And I know you're thinking, Tom, with an epic beard like that, you probably know something about gentrification. Well, first of all, to that I say, sick burn. Okay. Second of all, most of the policy dealing with gentrification happens at a local level. So familiarize yourself with your council person and city government, because those are the laws that affect you the most day to day. And on a personal level, shop local, become part of your community, and take your earbuds out and actually talk to people, because diversity is worth fighting for. And it doesn't matter when you moved where, there was someone there before you, you're not Magellan, and you didn't discover sh New York has been subject to many federal education, welfare, and incarceration policies like the war on drugs, which have further stigmatized black people and created division. But the city has also enacted its own bad policies. This is a know your rights mural. They were often located in minority neighborhoods and most are gone now, but they were painted to inform citizens of their rights against police and were made in response to the stop and frisk policy of the NYPD. It allowed police to stop and search anyone based on probable cause, but the program disproportionately targeted minority communities. In 2002, around 97,000 stops were made under the program. By 2011, that number had grown to almost 700,000 stops. 
Latinos and blacks accounted for about 50% of the city's population, but accounted for almost 84% of all stop and frisks. In 2011, 41.6% of all stops were blacks or Latinos aged 14 to 24, and there were more stops of young black men in New York than the population of young black men. You're probably thinking, Tom, but minorities commit more crimes. Well, 90% of the people stopped under the program were innocent, and blacks and Latinos were less likely than whites to have weapons or contraband. The program was eventually found unconstitutional, but Mayor Bloomberg defended it as law and order, which in addition to being a TV show that has never hired me as an actor, I'm not bitter, is a term that describes justice policies that disproportionately affect minorities. Think about it, when's the last time you heard someone invoke law and order against school shootings or violence against women? In an attempt to recap and make understatement of the year, New York City history has been bad for black people. But as the last week or two have shown us, people are slowly realizing that we are all responsible for this. And there's opportunity to improve our city by educating ourselves, speaking out, and taking action. While New York and the United States were flawed in their foundings, the genius in our Constitution exists in its ability to change, which is also the beauty of being human. It is up to each one of us because the American way of life has to represent more to the rest of the world than just TGI Fridays. And it is our diversity that makes us strong and interesting, so we must listen, learn, and do better. Well, if that's the end of the video, I hope you enjoyed it. Please subscribe and follow me on Instagram. Uh, not in real life. <laughs> Okay, anyways, this video is not about white versus black or Democrat versus Republican. It is about everyone versus racism. And to quote the Ellis Island immigrant Irving Berlin in his famous song, God Bless America. It's a little pink. I uh, messed it up in the wash.